So, Rick Pastor, thank you for being here. Yeah, good. Thank you so much for having me. I'll give the, the listeners a peek behind the curtains. We were five minutes into the conversation and I realised that we weren't recording. So you have a hard stop in about 45 minutes. I'm going to try yes. my best to get through as much as we can in that time. Um, I'll oh, roll bro. straight into it. Today we're going to be talking about productivity, your new book, Grip. Um, let's start here. So it's really hard to focus these days. Everything feels urgent. Emails pile up, plans come out of nowhere. And it feels like it's really hard to kind of take control of our time and our attention how do you think that we as a society got here? Yeah, so I think I think most of it was not is not on, happen didn't happen on purpose, right? So um, the reasons for it is that our work um, is more and more complicated, and there is there is so much going on every single day, like so so many different inputs, uh, and and one of the reasons biggest reasons for that is that our communication became uh, instant uh, to uh, to to basically all over the world. So so. One, our work got more complicated, and second, the world got way smaller. Uh, we're able to work with people all over the world, and um, those two are really, really complicated. And and, and I think um, where that drives to is that um, that there's there is no guardrails in place like we had before, where it was just nine to five, and then you got out of work, and then have some time to decompress. Um, what actually happens, of course, what a lot of people experience is that there is so much to do. There is an endless list of stuff that can be done. There's an endless uh, amount of opportunity for us as well. Um, and we need we need personal ways to deal with that. We need personal ways to handle all, all of those responsibilities. Uh, and I think that's where uh, ultimately you end up with the, th- with the stuff that I, that I um, write about and think about a lot and also depend upon myself uh to um to survive frankly to be able to function uh and uh and ultimately that that that's that's a set of rules that's a set of systems that uh allow me to turn off how i feel and then give myself over to a way of working that allows me to thrive so we talk about that that system which allows you to be productive come what may um how is it that you arrived at this system? Because we, we know the story, right? That you're in school and you're told kind of where to be and what to do at any given time. And you think this is brilliant. I can get stuff done. Uh, but then we step out into the real world, into the adult world. And those guardrails that you speak of are kind of taken away. And very quickly, we can find ourselves kind of chasing our tail and not really getting stuff done. Was there a particular moment in your life that you thought, ah, I need a system? Or was it quite gradual? Yeah, so so it's more of the latter. I think there was there was never this lightning bolt moment where I was on my knees and really needed something to uh, to be able to actually live on. Um, what did happen to me, and I think that's that's still the case, is that we never really get taught how to do this. So you, so where I agree on what you're saying that you get handed some kind of way of working, it's it's mostly implicit uh, from from my experience. So you get handed a lot of stuff you need to do. Um, but there is no one really telling you like, hey, this is how you could structure your week in order to actually get all this stuff done. Um, we need to figure that out based on what people are saying to us or maybe you have some examples. Mostly we have bad examples around us. So so that's really difficult. And I think something that I experienced when I was um, in my um, uh, in my education, I, I, I'm, I'm an engineer by background, so um, did uh, information sciences and then uh, in the second year, I launched my own company. What we quickly realized is that um, uh, companies and clients are not paying you if it's not done, if it's not according to uh, what you discussed. And in order to meet the deadline, well, you need to have some kind of way to, to deal with that. And that was the first experience that I had where I thought like, hey, if I'm committing to something, I, I, I not only need to commit to uh, what the result is, but I also need to have a plan, some kind of a plan in place to get there. Um, otherwise, I'm setting myself up for failure. And um, th- that was really the first step into exploring like, okay, I need to meet this deadline. I need to, I need a system. And then what is there? What's what's out there? And and I, will, I, will, I can share a bit more on that process. But the second step for me was um, big insight when I moved from that, when I sold that company, the first company after six years to, uh, to a couple of uh, other people and then moved to a startup, is that with this, in a startup environment, you don't have this trigger of a client. 
and that sounds amazing uh, but it's also a huge red flag because um, there is no one really waiting on you to get it to get it done um, maybe you have some investors like I have now but like there's maybe some people that, that do that but if, if you are um, part of the team there is no uh, invoice that you need to send you just set you just like uh, you expect your, your your pay to come in every month and what I notice is that especially for people that are in their first jobs um, there is no no way to uh, have this feedback loop of hey uh, okay my way of working is actually not working for me because I'm not getting paid I'm getting into trouble what's actually happening is that they they feel a lot of times they ha they know they know how the world works of course when you're young you think that's the case and then they roll with that um and then ultimately that that results in uh quite a lot of cases of being really overwhelmed until burnout right because there is no um there is no stop there's no like there's a f when, when you run an agency there's a physical stop because the money is is it, you're running out of money if you do it yourself if you are an employee in a company there's always way too much to do and you don't have this trigger. So for me, that was a really big insight because um, I felt like, why are these people not experimenting with their way of working? There is no need to do it um, until it's too late, right? So, um, uh, and, and I think you are one of the one of the people that are that is actually spending a lot of time on this because it's uh, it's a crossover between you need it and also it's a hobby like to get to get uh, and I'm, I'm curious to hear your perspective uh, uh, a little bit if you, if you want to share on why you do this. Why is that? What's, what's driving you? Because a lot of people are, are, like, um, are not like that. Uh, they just want to get by, uh, which is fine. Like there's a huge group of people that just want to, get, to have, a, have, a, have an okay life and do the job well and then return to friends, whatever, hobbies. Lots of my kind of self-experimentation, it's interesting that I, I reflect on both of your points there, lots of my self-experimentation came in the first instance through necessity, right? So mm -hmm. um, this is the first real business I've ran the agency. I had a few kind of part-time hobby businesses which didn't really do much in the years when I was kind of leaving school. However, when I sat down in the office on that first week when we were in Cardiff and I'm like, right, we're going to run a business. I would start working and then immediately I would realize that I don't know what I need to be doing or immediately I realized that I was in a conversation or there were emails or I was distracted. And for the first couple of weeks, I thought, look, I'm new to this. Maybe this is just how things are. But to your first point, right, we only get paid when we deliver work. Our clients expect results from us and nothing else. They don't generally speaking they don't care how we get to the results they just want the results and so if the results don't exist the invoice doesn't get paid as you say exactly. exactly and I was about a year into it and I thought you know what like the way of working which everybody see, it's like the emperor's new clothes like nobody talks about the fact that nobody gets any work done and I was like this just isn't going to work because there is no person above me and Richard and Alex the other owners of the agency there's nobody above us to pay us and bail us outright it's either exactly. we make this work or it doesn't work. And so that's when yeah. I started experimenting through necessity. But then after yeah. that, and it would be interesting to hear your thoughts on this, it almost becomes a hobby in and of itself to see how you can do more, to see what time and attention you can win back and just to kind of not optimize for optimized sake because it's always an end goal. But once you have kind of one foot in the door, it's really quite addictive to just see how you can get more. And I fully agree. And I think personally, I... I love seeing people flip like like this is the moment where you realize where you where you when you get into this growth mindset and when you get into like oh wow I can like with this with small and tiny changes um, uh, and I, this is also why I love James Clear his book Atomic Habits or BJ Fogg or for that matter like focusing on habits is very powerful because with tiny changes and that's why of course his subtitle tiny changes deliver huge remarkable results and i think as soon as you grasp that for the very first time uh, i see a lot of people like okay so i can do a lot more um i have like the world is at my feet it, like i can do basically whatever i want and um seeing that switch over seeing that happening is something that excites me um uh, but also what i experience every single day for myself where I'm like um, there is there is these 
these tiny levers that you can work on that you can that you can try and and play with that could have massive massive results and i think most people are are way underestimating their themselves in terms of what they can accomplish what they can reach uh, with sustained and a structured set of of things that you do every single day or every single week it's interesting that you reference james clear there because i've said for a few years now i don't have any tattoos and i can't really imagine myself getting a tattoo of anything that doesn't really mean anything but that exponential growth chart i'm so tempted one day to have that just small tattooed on my forearm because if you remember that it's not the big jumps it's not the quantum leaps as um jeff olsen says in the slight edge but rather it is just those daily compounding Mm. effects that make everything happen in life i think that's such a powerful reminder so your your end result so to speak of those daily compounding effects is the grip system how would you explain the system from like a thirty thousand feet point of view yeah so i think one point that I want to make in regards to this exponential growth point is that I do believe um, habits should be accom- accompanied with some kind of horizon, some kind of some kind of perspective of where you're going and what you're working on. I think those are that is my my biggest uh, comment on this system is that some that sometimes it turns into a a list of things that you need to do every single week without having a sense of direction. And if you look at from a 30, 30 foot, or what, I don't know how you, how you were saying, 30 foot, um, a 30,000 foot perspective on what's grip, it's a combination of those two. It's something, it's, it's stuff like it's, it's, a, it's a system you can apply to every single day to think less about where you're going. So to be in execution mode, combined with a structure that helps you to think where you want to be and i think those two are crucial but should never be like this like intertwined in your day because then is what 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 happens then is that you're constantly thinking about um, strategy and execution all at the same time and those two are very different um, brain activities one is really focused on what's in front of me right now. I want I want to be focused for 100% on this conversation and not thinking about, okay, where this how does this fit into my bigger perspective of one where I personally want to be in 10 years. Um, but I do need time to explore this question uh, in a structured way, not every once in a while, not when I'm 40, 50, and I'm thinking like where I'm what what have I actually been doing? I need some kind of a um, well, check-in points, milestones that I know that I'm working towards. And that's like grip gives you, gives you bo- both of them. And um, that's on, a, uh, if you look at the book, it's three, it's, it's basically three segments. So it's grip on your week, uh, grip on your year and on, on your life. And then um, I, I almost always start with the explanation of the week, but uh, your question leads more towards grip on your year, because I think, having um, yearly goals broken down into quarterly goals and then uh, linking those to your Friday recap or weekly review, however you want to call it, on a weekly basis gives you this really gradual, like high level to gradual um, uh, way to, to give yourself direction and then combine with the tools to make it happen. So let's, um, based on what you just said and our time limitations, I was going to do week first and then year. But if I'm being honest with you, the most profound process that i went through as a result of your book you may have heard in last week's episode i was in uh dublin a few weeks back just before i caught covid and found myself sat at home for weeks so it was this weird kind of anti-climax where i'm like yeah i've got the plans for the year oh no i can't do anything um but i went through the grip your year uh, process i sat down for a few hours i followed it to the letter and i think that that's what i've been lacking in previous years 2020 i said i don't want any outcome-based goals that was kind of a mistake on reflection 2021 truthfully i just didn't set any goals because i feel like lots of people didn't everything was so up in the air Um, but in the four Mm. weeks since i followed the year process i have so much clarity and it feels like i now know what i'm doing on a longer term basis and that was one of my issues right that i know what i need to do when i get into the office every day because there's a big list of stuff but where does that lead us what do i need to add into that to move things forward and so let's run through the three sections of grip your year and maybe you can just explain to listeners in a in a very brief way what each of those are so the first is what gets you out of bed yeah and i think this is um what i really try to do if you 
in in the book is give you the practical implement implementation of stuff that's not new like th this is really not um uh it's, it's really not rocket science the this chapter on what gets you out of bed basically helps you figure out in the in the most basic kind of way uh what drives you what motivates you it's like it's, it's exploring what your passions are um uh where you want to go with your mission and what you're good at your skills and um, uh, I know there's also this Ikigai method, which is a bit more expansive, that, ha that has a bit more components. If I think about it in the most simplest way, most of those like I'm, uh, are folded in one way or another in these, in these type of um, like passion, skills, or mission. So for me, that's really um, um, helpful to figure out uh, what motivates me, what drives me, uh, and uh, what excites me. And if I believe if you map out uh, those three topics uh, and see how much of your what you're doing maps like uh, ticks those three boxes the more you tick the better they will fit into um, what you like what you like to work on so that's basically the concept of that chapter to allow you to to spend a little bit of time on this on this question and then uh, if I move over to the second chapter in the in, in the second uh, segment, so that's about making a plan for your year. That's basically taking the results of the of the chapter on what gets you out of bed and then saying, OK, and now if you know this, now if you have these questions answered, how do you make this happen? And I believe that New Year's resolutions are um, are nice, um, but they are way too like way too big. Um, uh, like their the skill is too big. One year is too long for us, and uh, second, they are mostly too vague. So what happens? Of course, it's February. You set these 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 year type of goals, and then you think, oh, I have until I, I still have I still have um, ten months left. So um, I will wait a bit, and then you push it forward, and then of course it's, suddenly it's November, and you think. Oh, I had these resolutions. What really happened with it? Um, should I try to uh, pick it up or? Well, of course not, because uh, the goals were so big, you won't even be able to get them done. So the second chapter basically guides you through doing a proper reflection um, uh, on past year, uh, looking back extensively as you've done uh, when you when you took your trip and um and then getting you through a brainstorm phase where you're thinking about okay without any set of um, um restrictions in terms of time money or energy what would i possibly want to do in terms of all the different categories that i'm exploring in 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 the section and then uh the third part of that is okay now break that down to a set of goals that excite you and that are really specific for the next three months because one month is too short right the month is like i feel that january just started but we're already halfway through right so if i set set my goals in january um the, the month was always uh, is, 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 is uh, almost over already and the quarter uh, i have quite a bit of time to do quite big things um uh, but it's also still within reach it's still something that i can work towards um so that's basically the second chapter of it creating this plan and now at the end of the result, you have your goals. And I think one thing that I love about goals is that um, uh, that one, it really works. It really worked well if you set these concrete stuff. Um, but the reason for folding it into the book is also that, especially for young people that only um, work with goals in a, in a team or corporate environment, they have this huge negative response to it. The reason for that is that it's treated as a stick. It's treated as a way to to get employees to do more, while I believe that goals can be uh, can be huge for prioritization, can be huge to figure out where you want to go, uh, and also to say no to things, which is really important. So that's the outcome of the second chapter. The third one is something that um, that talks about a system, like an additional component to it, which is an accountability partner. Um, I don't know if like I didn't hear you talk about this in in your last episode if you already tried this, but to me that has been um, really really transformational into what I get done. Like we are only as strong as uh, our like most of our willpower uh, and our discipline. And I think rolling someone in in the scene uh, into the scene that helps us out 
um, is, uh, is, is transformational because they are able to ask you the questions that um, you, you'll probably evade at some point. Um, so uh, with, this, with this guy, we've been doing this since 2014. Um, I have weekly conversations of 30 minutes where we go over how did last week go? What are you planning next week? Why didn't it happen? What did you like? Like it's a really brief um, uh, prepared conversation. And it's a huge energy boost and also uh, a great a great way to think like, okay, I'm next Tuesday, I'm talking again to this guy. Uh, and uh, well, I better get going because uh, it's already, it's almost Tuesday already. So I need to get this, uh, this stuff done. So that's basically the second, the second part in a nutshell. Um, I'm going to reflect on those points backwards because it's interesting what you said. So the, the accountability partner, I, I entirely believe the merits of it. I haven't yet found one, not least because I want this book in people's hands to understand the system to then be like, right, let's team up on this. But it's really interesting. I was reflecting, as you said there, that in a weird sort of way, this podcast kind of is my outsourced accountability partner in as much as from listening to the previous episode, you roughly know the format, right? I sit here and I tell the world, whoever will listen, exactly what's going on in work, in my personal life, with my goals, what kind of habits I want to instantiate. And it's really awkward on the weeks when I have to sit down and be like, I didn't do any of those things. I've made no progress. Something has gone wrong. So from that point of view, I buy the merits of it. I'm just still on the hunt for my accountability partner to make it work more long term. No, I, and, and I think that's a, that's a, a great way. I think the... Um... Uh, there's there's of course limits to what you will share because it's public and we all have these areas in life where sometimes you need a little bit of grace and sometimes you need a little bit of a push and sometimes it's hard sometimes it's soft and i think uh, with derek my accountability partner we started off really on talking about work a lot but since then we both turned into dads we both have like um, marriages that like I'm I'm already married for ten years, so that's that's young. That's a long time, and there's a lot of stuff happening. So you need sometimes you need to talk about those th kind of things too. Like what is going well? What how how do I env envision this? And of course, these are type of things that a lot of people don't really like to to talk about in public. And um, uh, and the more honest I can be in these type of conversations, the more I can get get out of it. And and I think it's a uh, it's a safe space where I can not, not only share the things that are going well, but also can be really like um, really vulnerable in terms of what's happening. You can go into that area. You don't have to because you can also, I don't also know people that use accountability strictly for work, um, but our, our lives is not, uh, are, are, not, are not only work, right? There's a lot of other stuff hap happening as well. So I think that's really useful. So then to move up to the previous chapter on your point there, I think that's what's so interesting, or at least what I found so effective about pairing the reflection of the previous year using things like my camera roll, which is an amazing hack, by the way. I've never thought that actually I have this day by day documentary of exactly what I've done on it's demand to reflect on a year. Yeah. Yeah. So useful. Uh, but what yeah. I find useful about both that reflection and also the the subsequent planning is that any system I've used in the past for planning a year is very kind of shirt and tie. It's very business, 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 but it doesn't take into account all of the things that you just spoke about, which absolutely have a bearing not only on our time from kind of pressures when things come in from the side that we haven't accounted for, but also from a motivation point of view, right? It's all well and good setting out these big work goals and these big financial targets. But if you're not focusing on things such as giving is one, which I realized when I was working through your process, I dedicate zero pounds and zero hours to giving and that was like a really profound actually if I'm not giving back if I'm not trying to contribute to something greater that isn't just money in my pocket what am I doing this all for and so what I find interesting about the year plan if you can maybe dive into it slightly more from how you you came up with it is that you're really looking at every aspect of your life not just your kind of outcome-based business or work targets yeah so I think um this this comes down to the fact that um, the, the, the there's there's a ton of these type of frameworks out there that do this type of, type of thing and and it's, it's more and more popular to do a type of annual review. So I don't want to take credit for um, for coming up with this list of of categories. Um, I do think that the first time I tried it, I was like, I think everyone should at least spend a little bit of time on this reflection uh, and. 
because that's profound. That's already giving you so many insights without even setting goals that will change your, your, uh, your year. And, um, when I, it's actually kind of ludic ludicrous if you think about it, that, that if you, if you talk to your friends and ask them, do you spend time on just thinking about last year? Almost no one really does it. So our days are packed from the moment we, we get out of bed until the moment we get back in with inputs and we are when are you ever really really sitting still like when are you really quieting down all the, the things around you and think about what happened and that that to me is something that um i've been doing with a with a lot of with a lot of people um actually during this christmas i hosted the uh, the third edition of the Dutch year plan day, which, um, which I will host in th this week as well in, in English, um, where, where I really saw people saying, I, I started doing, I started doing this review with the perspective of this was a shitty year, but now I went through my pictures. Now I went through my, my calendar. I went through my notes. I saw all these amazing things that I did, my, the progression that I made. Um, the change that I went through at home or at, in my personal life or at work, all the stuff that I did. And it, and that changes the way you look at yourself, what you're able to get done. And I think that's, that's huge, right? That gives you this boost, uh, this platform, but also it shows you exactly where, um, uh, like this, give, it gives you these insights of the stuff that you think, oh, well, did this, this approach really did not work for me as well. Um, I, I really want to experiment with this if that makes sense. I, absolutely. I wrote an Instagram caption about eight hours before midnight on New Year's Eve as a direct result of your process on the exact topic you just said. I was so ready to say that 2021 was pointless and it was a waste and the business didn't do all the things it wanted to do and I didn't get to do X, Y, Z. And then I followed your process and I reflected and I actually pulled down into the granular level of, for example, the summary of each month and kind of what went well in that month and what didn't. And as well as realizing how long a year actually is. Like in December, January, things that happened back then felt so long ago and I'd completely forgotten. But just that slight reframing of actually in a year when everything seemed shit and everything was closed and everything was slow, I still did so much. There was still so much opportunity. That that just was such a boost for me to be like, right, well, if I can do that in a year when everything's upside down, let's really drill down and focus on what I can do this year. One thing I want to ask is if somebody has gone through the what gets you out of bed and they've looked at all of the things that they're good at and passionate about and so on, um, but then they move down to planning their year and they're living quite a restrictive life for whatever reason. Maybe they're in a job which they need to be in right now to pay the bills because they're very kind of hand to mouth, mm. but that doesn't align with anything that's in those values or goals and so on. What kind of small steps can somebody take this year to help push the needle towards those things that they know drive them if they don't have the, I guess, the benefit to just go all out like somebody like you or I might do? So I think most of us don't realize that we have uh, we have way more hours in the day to spend on these type of things. And and I'm referring to a book which is called, uh, which, which is written in, in the early 1900s. Uh, it's, 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 it's a book called 24 Hours a Day. And, um, I think it's one of the earliest product productivity books that's out, that's out there. And for me, it's, it's really short. And I, I very much recommend it because he's basically saying so, so much of our time is spent doing, doing nothing. Actually, uh, it was already happening then, but we treat our work day as our, the time to do work right between eight and maybe six, um, sometimes shorter, sometimes longer. And then we disregard the other eight hours that we have, basically our second work day, which is happening around the time. So maybe a couple of hours before breakfast, like you are doing, especially like starting, starting early, but also in the evening, there's a lot of time. And um, I, don't, I definitely don't wanna recommend filling up um, the whole day with the same activity, but he's arguing, I think quite profoundly, that we don't need rest from work, we need different activities. We need to switch activities and we feel tired, but that's also routine. And that's also what you, ex what you come to expect, what your, what your body also expects. So, so if you, if you watch TV every night, I think just think about the sheer number of hours that we spend on consuming something, 
um, that's um, most of them not contributing towards some of the stuff that you really want to do. So if someone says, I don't have time to like to, to spend on something that I find fun, that's linked to my passion because it's not in my day job, that's something that I'm good at, that's not, that's not happening in my day job or something that contributes to a certain mission that I have that's not happening in my day job. I would say find yourself 30 minutes every day and some some part of the day that that's convenient for you or one evening a week that you say okay i'm going to dedicate this evening or this block in the morning towards this thing that i'm passionate about so like ticks, ticks one of the three boxes right and then maybe two of the three and then slowly you see okay i learn stuff that i take back to work or hey i see opportunities that maybe allow me to switch the, the things that i'm working on the, my day job but you can you can really start in the margins of the day that's actually not a margin that's a whole second work day <laughs> that's 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 available to us there and especially if you're young um because i'm turning into well all that now and i find that i need way more sleep uh, as 10 years ago um sometimes i'm thinking i wasted so much time in the in my evenings because i thought i was tired but actually I was nowhere near tired at that point, uh, as tired as I sometimes feel now when I'm woken up multiple times in the night by kids. Um, but to, so I think I would, that, would, that would be my suggestion if um, to explore uh, what other parts of your day you can actually use. I wrote most of the book um, when I was at the full time job in the startup. I dedicated two hours every week um uh morning hours when most of the time most of the time the people in my company were were starting at at 10 uh in the morning so most of the engineers wake up late uh anyway so i was spending those 2 hours writing on the book in a coffee shop nearby and then going to the, to to the office at that point still uh when i was 2018 and most of them i was still the first one in the office uh so people didn't even notice that i was writing this so just to say there is way more time and space uh, available. Uh, you just have to find the moment that works for you in terms of energy. Um, uh, but then there's a lot of space to explore. It's two interesting things that come to mind when you say that. The first is, uh, particularly if, I have an, if you have an iPhone, I'm not sure if the same is true on Android, but you literally have a a second by second breakdown of exactly where you waste your time right and i track lots of metrics inside of a spreadsheet that's just the kind of person i am and you know any sort of metric that i track kind of seems to go in the right direction other than screen time i struggle so much to push it down and yet mm. i know that i do not have the excuse whenever i say i don't have time to do something because the data is in front of me right i have two hours and 41 minutes a day that i'm doing something unimportant that if i really needed to pivot into it, i could and the reason i think that's interesting on reflecting on your answer to my previous question is that i think that kind of mini case studies are really important you need to build the momentum and the belief within yourself that you can truly do something before you actually go all out. The same was true of this podcast, right? This podcast in its previous kind of version was little Instagram videos I did because I didn't think mm. I had the confidence to do a podcast. And before that, it was tweets where I was tweeting not as just kind of a generic person, but sharing my thoughts because I didn't believe that I could yet do videos. And the second you start plowing kind of small case studies into your life to prove that you can do things using that time that we have because the data's there it's so transformational because kind of one thing leads to another, right? And so I think that, yeah, I, I absolutely agree with your approach there. 100%. And I think what what's, there is, there's, um, it's easy to fall in, into the trap of looking at people that seem to be, to have arrived, right? They seem to have done the big things uh, without seeing what happened before that, without seeing all the small steps that people took. So I think, from like my the first steps for for me not not to say that that I've arrived nowhere near but like the first things that I did before writing the before writing the book is um, I did experiments of of doing uh, one month um, uh, like a, a blog post every single day and then I thought hey this is quite nice this momentum is nice this works for me um, if I want to write more I should do this and then uh, in 2016 I believe it was I did a daily newsletter for a year. So write an, a brief news newsletter on work and productivity and product management for every, for every single day. And that really pushed me to, uh, to stretch what I could do in besides, besides my day job. 
and uh, I, I fully subscribe to your idea of really starting small and then but gradually expand it and then before you know it people will look to what you've accomplished and you see what happened well, like all the small steps that happened and the, the long like the long tail of stuff that that allowed, that brought you here um, which is tremendously tremendously powerful but also takes up a lot of time and, and effort and energy so let's drill down into those small steps i've got three kind of headline questions i want to try and squeeze in in the next 10 minutes so um the small steps are really kind of won or lost based on how you plan your week and how you plan your day. At least that's that's the idea that I subscribe to, right? If you're not planning to do things, they don't get done. Talk me through the gripping of a week. How do you go about planning an optimal week to make sure that you get done what you need to get done? Yeah, so that start for me, it starts with the calendar. And I'm a huge fan of what David Allen um, wrote in Getting Things Done. Uh, there's one thing that he and I disagree on very much, and that's the use of the calendar. I spoke to to him a couple of times about this. He's, li he's he lives quite close by here in Amsterdam, so we, we we chatted about this, and we just disagree. Like he believes it should start with the to-do list, where you pick off things, you you make sure that you have this ordered in uh, in terms of m maybe priority or and project, and you work from the top to bottom. I believe that there is so much happening on a set time in the day that um, this list will always be endless. And there is no way to really figure out when stuff should happen and actually what cannot happen. So I, um, I found that I really need to start with the calendar. And the calendar is fantastic. It's a fantastic piece of software because it's finite. And it's actually the only tool that's finite, uh, which is such a relief and also a constraint that, that, uh, that frustrates me every single day of course because uh because our time is limitless on this on this planet and we need to like i want to get most out of it why it's such a powerful tool is that people and uh, people say to me like i try to to put everything that i had previously in my to-do list that i need to get done this week i try to put it in my calendar it won't fit so rick what I, what can i do to make it fit and then of course i say this is exactly the goal of doing this exercise uh, that you notice that you have made way too many um, um, promises and and you, you you towards other people to get stuff done in this week while you should be saying no a lot more and then trying to map out your week um, it will show you clearly what can and what cannot happen and that in itself is so powerful because now you really need to make the decisions on what you're spending your valuable time on and figure out a way to make better decisions there. Instead of just saying, I will fit in these 20 things. Of course, you start with the easy ones, the difficult and important ones that are not urgent, always fall off the wagon. And do that for a couple of years and you're running behind. Uh, turn it around and start every day with at least a single thing that's important, but not urgent, like the Eisenhower matrix, is um, has this co compounding effect that you will see have, have results in the next couple of years. So that's... That's really the biggest chunk of it. Having uh, this calendar be your ultimate rock and guide into how you spend your time. Um, I live by it. If it's there, I do it. There is no discussion. There is no way to evade it. It's the, if it's there, I do it. And then the other stuff is hap is living in the task in, in the task manager. Um, so that's a, that's really the second step to the to the system because of course n not everything not everything will fit into the into the calendar. I do it on a week by week basis. So everything else is in the, in the to-do manager, to-do list. Um, uh, yeah, so that's basically it. Something about the, uh, so I, I love the, the getting things done methodology, but something that I really agree with there is that uh, with David Allen's mind dump, I can sit there and I can make 116 different things I need to get done in any given week. But where I always tripped up almost without fail is that, I guess two things. Number one, it's quite hard to discern when you're not adding time to things in a calendar. It's quite hard to discern is point number 83 actually more important than point number 84. And then, of course, the second thing is that you're never going to get around to point 84 anyway because you haven't scheduled all of this stuff. So I do mm -hmm. think, of course, I use a calendar, but I'd always just used a calendar for things like this when it was a fixed time meeting to kind of have a start point and an end point and send out a Google Meet link. And that was my use of a calendar until recently. Don't get me wrong. There are days when I slip up. There are days when I see that Google calendar oh, line dragging down and I'm like, my God, I haven't finished this thing. And it's about to reach two items down. But generally speaking, I think that 
I have learned in the last three or four weeks that if you don't allocate time to something, it doesn't get done. And that if you're not taking into account the finite time which we have, you're never actually really prioritizing. You're just kind of ordering. You're just kind of tidying up a list rather than setting fixed time. So they're the two the two real takeaways I took from the grip section. Yeah, yeah. So And, and, and I think um, what, I, what you're saying made me realize that you're already uh, a couple of steps uh, ahead of most people because most people are not even getting to the point of creating their own list. They're just responding. They're just in reactive mode. People are asking questions over Slack. There's emails coming in. There's appointments in your schedule that are scheduled by your manager or a team leader or, or the boss. And that's what people do. They just follow the lead. And I think everyone, regardless of where you are in the organization, regardless of your role, can uh, use their calendar to drive tiny little bits of proactivity in each and every single day to work on the stuff that you think is important, which has uh, an, an, a profound effect on your uh, performance as an employee, but also your pers- what you can personally achieve. And one, f- one way to frame it is also to think about it in a way of what activity, because people ask, okay, what's then important? What should I put in the calendar? Um, the, the answer that I always give is this Eisenhower matrix, of course, is the first one like important, not urgent, that's the key. Um, But sometimes it's hard to think about, okay, what is then important, not urgent? The way to frame it that's really useful to me is what could possibly get me a promotion, uh, a salary increase or an award internally? Like these type of, you won't get this this salary increase, uh, uh, at least not from me. Uh, But like this way of looking at it, thinking about it will trigger some stuff like, hey, oh, wow, that's, that's not dealing with my mailbox. I'm not paid to, to, to get to inbox zero. I'm paid to deliver fantastic results for clients. I'm paid to um, really bring the business forward, if that makes sense. Absolutely. So we spoke then very briefly about the days when that Google Calendar line is tracking downwards and you're not keeping up, whether because uh, the time allocated to something was incorrect or it's just one of those days that we all have where you get out of bed and you just think, oh, I can't be bothered today. What is it that you do on those days to... Uh, not have that domino effect where one bad day leads to a bad week, which writes off a month. How do you stay on track that next day when you have an off day? Okay, so one principle that I live by is doing a Friday recap or a weekly review. This is also not new. Uh, David Allen uh, is also the founder of the weekly review movement, basically. Uh, But it's, it's basically setting aside at least 30 minutes every single week to do a brief reflection of what happened in this week and how you will to your next, what, what's the, what the plan is for next week. To me, that's kind of safety net below everything that allows me to let go of the daily schedule if the, uh, if the need really arises. So by default, I'm saying, okay, I do what it, what it says, but if that for some reason does not happen, I know that on Friday I will look at it and I will pick up the scraps and I will make a new plan and I will follow it. Like I'm also a human. So this is what happens. Um, being able to trust on this moment in my calendar allows me to way more free than most people think. Um, if they think about uh, using their, their calendar to schedule stuff and think about how my calendar must look uh, with every minute of the day planned, which is not the case. Like I'm quite flexible with that. And the second the second thing here is that if you decided what you work on, you also now know what you're saying no to. You now know what did not happen which is so freeing because before you would say, okay, I have an off day. What did not, what did I, what, what did that, did I not get to um, that I needed to get to today? I don't know because the list is 80 points long. There's so much I did not get to do, but if it's on the calendar, you know, these four things that I made maybe promises to, to a colleague or to a client, I did not get to them. Can I do them tomorrow? Can I shuffle things around? Maybe I can, or should I call those clients and say, can we do it next week? They will say, that's fine. And now I am stress-free again. Uh, and this is why it's such a, like these are actually not ways to get it done, to push yourself, but these are the ways to make it more, um, make it make it easier on yourself. And then the second thing in terms of uh, getting it done is learning from the timing that you used, learning from the duration, and then adapting in the next week. Because you know that if you're writing something in the morning and every single week, this is the block you're skipping. Try another time. Try another duration. Try another day. But and now you have this information to actually trigger your next experiment, which you did not have before, which is for me um, 
very, very like essential and crucial amazing rick this has been incredible thank you so much for your time grip is out on the 3rd of february this year i'm going to put a link to the amazon listing in the show notes if people want to go and find your stuff or maybe take part in that uh, the year plan day if they can before then where should they head to find you i think the very best way to do that is on gripbook.com so that's the place to actually pre-order the book if it if it's still not out uh, or order it find the find the best place to do that Second is I'm uh, quite active on Twitter uh, on uh, uh, Rick Pastor if you how you say it or, uh, on uh, on Twitter so that's the place to to find it and otherwise I think um, my suggestion or ask would be um, figure out at least one experiment to try in the next week one thing to, that you want to change and you want to play with and get into the habit of doing these type of small experiments will lead you to to great results so thank you so much for having me it was uh, it was a pleasure Sean. Likewise, thank you so much. Cheers.